Welcome to Game Breakers podcast in association with Rhinos Rugby League, where we look to bring you tips, insights and experience from the world of sport. My name is Rob Nicolay and as always I'm joined by my co-host Danny Wilson. But today we are joined by former Bradford Bull and Leeds Rhinos, Great Britain and England captain and one of the game's most decorated players with nine grand final wins, four Challenge Cups, four World Cup Club Challenge wins, five League Leaders Shields, the 2003 Man of Steel and not forgetting receiving MB in 2012 in Jamie Peacock. Thanks for joining us, JP. Pleasure, absolute pleasure, lads. How are you two doing? Good. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, just echo what Rob said then. You're, you're a man who's got a lot on his plate and very busy, so I really appreciate you giving some time to, to talk to us. No, any time. Yeah, you know, we, we've got a good relationship. We know each other, and if it gets out in the rugby community, then that's great. I mean, I think podcasts have been a great thing to come out of lockdown, haven't they? The ability to listen to other people, and I think uh, being on lockdown and just the... the the way people are using uh, Zoom in uh, and Google Hangout and everything, so that opened a lot of people up to uh, listening to podcasts and also getting all the guests as well. So, yeah, pleasure to be on it. Fantastic. Like I say, so speaking to you, and, you know, we've been lucky enough to, to work with you closely in the past. And I think for, for the viewers and listeners of the podcast, I think what, what we want to look at is the you know, mental skills to achieve, um, your, your attributes of, of a good leader. So to kick it off, um, can you describe yourself as a person? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think in life, I think you have to know what kind of what you stand for. Uh, I think, and as you, as you get older, you, you kind of understand more and more what you stand for as a person, you know, what, what your values are as a person. And I, I think mine are probably, uh, my values would be, uh, I, I'm honest, I'm almost as honest, honest as possible I can, you know, with myself and with other people. Um, secondly, I, I always try uh, and do the right thing, you know, which I think is morally the right thing to do. I think that's really important to me. Uh, um, thirdly, I always try, always try follow up and do what I'm saying I'm going to do. You know, if I'm going to say I'm going to do it to somebody, then I'll follow up and, and, and get that done. And I think uh, uh, that's kind of great skills to have in life. And I think the fourth thing for me, maybe, um, for me, what I stand for is I, I, I care about people and I think it's important to care about people and I think it's important to make sure you look out for other people in, in, in and around life. So kind of, you've asked me to describe myself, but I kind of just put down my, uh, them, my values as a person. Um, and I think if you're going to ask someone to describe themselves, then that's the values and that's kind of uh, who I am, I would like to think anyway. Outstanding, very good detail in there. I'm sure we'll go into a little bit deeper later on. But obviously, rugby league is, is very M62 corridor based, and we have a lot of guests on that are either Yorkshiremen or, or from Lancashire. You, you're a proud Yorkshireman uh, and, and an Englishman. What traits do you possess that reflect that of a Yorkshireman? Yeah, well, I reckon most people say Yorkshiremen are tight, aren't they? Uh, so <laughs> I nailed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm not quite sure I am that actually, but I think I'm quite generous as a person, so I'm probably the opposite to being tight like that. But I think I think uh, I showed my partner the other day the you remember the uh, the Olympics. I think was it in it was 2008 or 2012 when Yorkshire would have been a, a country on its own would have been in the top 12 uh, collecting medals for for the Olympics. So for me, I think Yorkshire people are. Uh, they've got some grit about them, you know, they're, they're resilient, they're, 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 they can be stubborn, I think, uh, but I think they can be honest and uh, caring about people, I, th I think. Um, and I think, honest, the thing I think about Yorkshire people is I, th I think they're trustworthy and authentic. And I think, you know, if you ask that about other people from outside Yorkshire, perhaps you kind of get that I I impression from them. So for me, they're, they're the ones, and I, and I think. Uh, they kind of blend into being, you know, what being English is about for me and the culture of being English or, well, certainly from being from Yorkshire anyway. Yeah, we're talking I mean, about... I think, oh, sorry, Rob, just authenticity touched on that. There, I think a few people have said that on this. And I think being authentic and genuine um, probably ties in with honesty, but builds trust. And, and especially from a business point of view or um, a leadership point of view, trust is, is key and authenticity seems to be a massive trait. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think it's very important in life to be authentic. And the reason why you would be authentic is, is because it creates trust. You, you think if you've ever worked with somebody who's all over the place and the, the 
times, you know, they've got different personalities for different people and in a different situation, they behave completely different. And, and basically, if they end up thinking they're fake and, and when someone's fake or not authentic, then you don't trust them. Uh, you lose trust in them. And I think trust is one of those things. If you think about it or if anybody's listening, you think about somebody who's lost You've lost trust in somebody. How hard is it to get back in that person? I, I think trust is one of those bridges that, that you can burn that's almost unrebuildable. So I, I think uh, to be authentic is a really important facet of, of just being, being a good person and also probably a, a good leader and an effective leader as well. Definitely. And you mentioned there what like you've been proud from, from Yorkshire and obviously uh, English. Receiving MBE, you know, just take us back to, to what and we talked to a lot about your honours there from a rugby league perspective. But what did it mean to receive that MBE and what was the day like? Yeah, I mean, that, that one was huge for me personally, um, just because I think it's you know, recognition, it is recognition from outside the sport. Uh, I think you list, listed a lot of things that I managed to win, which was with great teams, but it was all kind of rugby focused. And this is uh, recognition from um, outside the sport and the way. Um, I was with the England camp, I believe, in maybe 2011, and you, you get a day off during the week, and you, you head back home. And as you get head back home, you, you, you know, go through your mail and that, get all your kind of logistical stuff of, of your normal life sorted out. And in the letter, in the post that day, was a really official-looking letter, and I'm thinking, all right, I've got to speed and find it. Here. <laughs> uh, but then uh, I opened it, and uh, I was generally gobsmacked when, when I read the letter. It was saying, you know, the, the, the royal family were offering you the MBE, do, do you want to accept it? You have to accept it. Um, so I was like, yeah, 100% I'm accepting that. I thought, and then, you, you know, you're not allowed to uh, tell any, anyone, which generally means you can tell one person, doesn't it? I think uh, that's when people say that. So, you know, I, I spoke to my, my ex-wife then, and I think it's one of the, I told her, but I think it's, there's only two times in my life that I've generally been gobsmacked by news. You know, one was bad news with my father with uh, lung cancer. And that was really positive news. And then got down to, to go to Buckingham Palace um, and it was really good because my dad was really ill at that point probably I think he he had about eight months left to, he lived up eight months longer after that so uh, we, we got down there and one of my churches is I'm always really early for everything so we were the first people in Buckingham Palace um, when you get to Buckingham Palace they, they, they uh, split you you know your, your guests go separate and then you go in a different room and when I was in this different room with all the award winners I realised you know it's quite special this because everybody in that room about one person Sarah Stevenson uh, was I think we're about 70 years and older so I thought this is going all right they said we've got this in my mid-30s and then what they do somebody comes in and, and tells you, you know what, what's going to go through what the protocol is going to be when you meet the queen and how it's going to run and then they go through the the, the the SIRs and the CBEs and the OBEs first, and then the MBEs are last, which what I was. And then you go through, and as I went through to go meet the Queen in this big room, um, my dad was on the front row, my family, because they got there early. So my mum and dad were only probably five metres away from me. And if you think this room was probably 70 metres long, so that was brilliant. And then, you know, go up to the Queen, um, and then you, you, you hold her hand and then she, she does the sword thing and then she, someone's behind her says, you know, Jamie Peacock rugby league. So she says, you know, uh, do, do you enjoy playing the sport? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I love it. It's a great sport. She said, it must be a physical one. I said, yeah, it's a very physical sport. And she said, uh, have you been playing a long time? So at this point I said to her, oh, can't you tell by the silver hair I've got? I thought I'd crack a joke. And, and at that point she pushed my hand back. <laughs> and that was the end of our conversation uh, and I went off so that was winning the MBE and I think uh, the only reason for me you know winning the MBE was being in great teams I, I think people who win the MBE as an individual sports person or in you know say athletics or, or golf or, or tennis you, you know that's down for them but I think it was as much for me as the people I played alongside because the reason why I was able to be successful was I, I was fundamentally in successful teams when you're speaking then you can see obviously um, with your dad and, and the illness and him being there that obviously meant a lot to you what what was that like throughout your career and all the achievements having your family support and alongside you I, th I think it was really key with my dad um, just because I think when you get when you're older you realise um, kind of the sacrifices your dad makes taking you to training and all the time during your kid. I mean, we used to coach as a kid, then stop, but it still take me everywhere. They come and support every game. 
they'd always be there, um, you know, with, with support if you needed it. And also, a couple of things I learned from my dad. My dad was really a working guy. He was a quiet guy, but he had an exceptional uh, work rate. And I, I think that rubbed off on me as a, as a, as a person. Um, so I learned from him that way. But when you ever see an accolade like that, I, I can only, uh, you, you know, when you've got your own children and they play really well, or they do something that's, you know, a great achievement. You can feel incredibly proud of them, don't you? No matter what, it's, it might be like when you've got a daughter or a son and they win a certificate at school and they come back and show them. You, you feel really proud, don't you? And I think for him, you know, to see his son uh, to get an MBE, I think it must have been a great day for him. Knowing that he had, you know, long left to live, I think he was... My feeling was on the train on the way back that he was back to Leeds. That he was very, very pleased to be able to done that and see it and, and been part of that. Outstanding. Well, congratulations for that, anyway. Um, just, look, your, your career, we, Rob, as introduction, nearly collapsed by trying to read all those things you've, you've won. Uh, one of the most decorated players of all time there. So, just take us through your early parts of rugby. You mentioned there about training and sacrifices your dad made from amateur through to your first team debut. Obviously, you've achieved all that stuff and people look at you now and, and, and the brand that you, you, you've become. How did that start? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, uh, I think if people from rugby listen to this, they'll know that my journey to the top was probably different from a lot of people who captain England or, or your country or Great Britain. Because I think a lot of people who do that in sport are kind of earmarked out from a young age to do that. Maybe, you know, 14, 15, 16, this, this person's got potential to captain the country. Well, that was 100% not me. I mean, I, I didn't sign at 16. I didn't sign until I was nearly 19 years old. And even then, that was after a you know, 13-week long trial to get a contract. And um, I, I had a, you know, a number of setbacks along the way throughout my career. But I think the thing that... Um, all these setbacks and I think the difficulty in making it as a professional kind of... Uh, worked out for me in the end because I, I think, you know, you two guys deal with uh, a, a lot of kids coming through and I think um, what you often get when your kids sign professional at 16 is the player that's never had failure. He's never had any failure because he's been the best player all the way through. He's been the best player at his amateur side, been the best player for his city side. Then he plays for the academy, his best side in the academy and then they get into the first team and they're surrounded by men and they're no longer the best player anymore. Um, and they're, they're getting blamed for things and they and, and they find themselves in, in, a, in a world of trouble because they're not used to dealing with failure. They're not used to dealing with setbacks. Whereas myself, I, I kind of setbacks all the way throughout my career trying to make it to the top. So that kind of, all that experiences, I think it just allowed me to develop um, as a player. And I think, you know, what, what I thought, if it was to look at why I think I made it uh, as a player. Was a couple of things, you know. First, I've been in some great teams, you know, and I had some great role models when I came through at Bradford. Bradford was full of players for me, um, you know. At the beginning of the Super League era, look, we had some superstars. Don't get me wrong, there was, you know, Henry and Robbie Paul, uh, Liam Price, to be by kind of those types of players. But also at the heart of the team were were, were a lot of players, um, sort of like your, your Brian McDermott, uh, Bernard Dwyer, Scott Naylor, Mike Forshaw who would just absolutely outwork everybody. Uh, they had talent as players, but perhaps not as talented as the rest of them. But their work ethic and how they applied themselves was just outstanding. And that I kind of looked at that and I kind of realised, you know, I'm, I'm not the most talented player here, OK? But I can out, outwork people. Or I, I can um, work harder, work longer, train harder. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, the rubber skills I've got, that's my natural talent and I can improve them. Um, but hard work's the choice. You know, you, you will make a decision how 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 hard you want to work and how, how much effort you want to put in. For, and I and I think um, if you think about it, there's never been an academy player or a player let go and they've said, you know what, we'll we'll get rid of him because he works too hard, he trains too hard, he's too enthusiastic, so we'll get rid of him. And I thought to myself, well, that, they're the things that I'm going to bring to a team. You know, kind of effort infused as a and just make them toughness and uh, and because they're choices that I, I can make and I can be the best I can and be in those. And I kind of one story maybe which might resonate a bit was when I, because uh, I left school and started work and spent two or three years doing different jobs. And one of them was roofing, uh, labour for a roof for £20 a day, humping tiles 12 hours a day. Tough work that in the winter, horrible. 
Um, and I remember I signed professional and about 12 months into being a professional, we were training in January and we were doing 400 meter sprints uh, and it was the end of the week and it was tough, it was cold. And basically every bloke was moaning about it, about it being cold, about it being difficult. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I'm enjoying this because I'm getting paid to get fit. 12 months ago, I was getting paid 20 pound to lump uh, six towels at a time, up ladders for 12 hours a day. I'm actually getting paid fit for the job I actually love doing. So I always thought to myself at that point, this, this is going to be my kind of edge here and, and my advantage. So use those setbacks as an advantage. Outstanding. And when I listen to you talk there, I think one of the words that probably epitomizes all of what you do is that resilience, that mental toughness, if you like, however you want to define that, to, to keep going forward when probably the chips might be down. And we had a conversation um, maybe a year or so ago, whenever it was, you can run a marathon. And I said, how did you, how did you find the marathon? Was it tough? Probably a stupid question. Um, and he said, yeah, it was horrendous. But you've had a lot of dark times to draw on, he said, from experience. When he was running the marathon, it got tough. He found it manageable because you could draw on your, your dark times, if you like, as, as a sportsman. I think that builds resilience and character. Yeah, 100% it does. I, I think, you, you know, a good saying is, is to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And I think that's how you should train. And I think if you train that way, when it, when it gets exceptionally difficult in a game and in the middle, your fitness gets questioned more than any, any other area of, of the field. And say you're in a big game and you, you, you know, three back-to-back sets in, 18 tackles in, 70 minutes played, then you, you really find out about yourself how, how, how much you can push yourself and, 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 and how much you, you want things and how, how mentally tough and resilient you are. And I, I think the best come through those periods. And I think more than anything, the best kind of enjoy these periods uh, when it's like that because it makes me think about this new, uh, the, you know, the, play, the six again rule in, in rugby league is that I think the teams that come out on top are the ones that when they see it six again, they see it as an opportunity to show how fit they are and how tough they are rather than going, oh man, you know what, another six tackles to do, shoulders drop, this is going to be really difficult. I think any team that has the mindset of, right, let's bring it, we'll show how fit we are and we'll load them out for another six. And in fact, well, fuck it, if there's another set of six, we'll, we'll do that one as well. And, and I think that kind of mindset towards re- resilience is key. And I, I think you can build that through training, uh, making your training difficult and then you build that through putting yourself in situations where, where it's like that, where you've got to make decisions which are... Uh, uh, time and time again that if you don't make the right one if you don't push yourself hard then you let your team down and somebody scores so yeah you're right you know rugby league conditions you uh, certainly in the middle to be out of cope and be, become resilient definitely we spoke about obviously your achievements within the game within there and sort of reflecting on your career now looking back across that is there any memories that you hold um, sort of close to you that have happened within games, you know, so it's not necessarily the, um, you know, the medals, but w- some periods that you thought, right, that's got me through that, um, that you can draw on. Um, that's a really, that's quite a tough question. I, I think, I think, obviously, um, I, I, I could probably draw this to playing when you play the Australians, you know, in World Cup challenges or for England or bit, but you know, you, you're at, you're at the get best, you're at the benchmark and they're the games that you really want to prove yourself. So they they're the games as I got older, I, mean, I really enjoyed because I just thought this is going to be the ultimate test of your, your mental resilience, your physical capabilities. And if you come out on top and, and are a winner, uh, then you deserve it. And I think obviously there's a lot of, but a lot of great moments throughout my career and all the grand final wins, Challenge Cup wins, etc. Are, are, are wonderful and, and times I really remember. But I think um, the times winning for great Britain against Australia, which are the benchmark. They're, they're the ones that do stand out as my favourite memories um, as a player, as an ex-player, sorry. And I think, you know, you forget about lots of these. And I've been fortunate at Sky Sports to show lots of Great Britain's better moments so over the last uh, couple of months. And, and I, I never <laughs> never watch any games that, that I used to play in, but, but, you know, I caught myself watching a few of these. And it's been great watching them. And it's just been enjoyable as a... As a as an ex-player, looking back at uh, and savoring those moments and being with the, uh, playing with players from different clubs and representing your country and just kind of enjoying that challenge that the the the, the highest level of, of rugby league brings with it. Uh, so yeah, I mean they're the ones that stand out for you. And I think you know a standout game would be beating the Australians in Sydney. Um, I, it's something I, I dreamt of doing as a boy. I watched uh, my heroes uh, do that when Great Britain played. You know. 
like watching the likes of Ella Rianley, uh, Phil Clark, you know, Dennis Platt, Sandy Platt, Kevin Ward, these guys playing in those games. And for me, I always wanted to replicate that as a player and to be able to do it in 2006 was just absolutely something special. Yeah, and in, in some of them games and them internationals and the Great Britain vs Australia probably highlights and epitomises your lack of willingness to take a backward step certain moments in them games where just not taking a backward step and, and meeting challenges on the head certain, you know, maybe a bit of fisty cuffs and that type of thing. Well, I just think you're, you're right, Danny. You've got to lead by example. I, I think as a captain of a side, you have to lead by example and you have to be prepared to pay the price. And if that price to be paid is to stand up for your teammates and, and, and uh, don't care about your own physical well-being, well, so be it. That, that's the way it's going to be for, for that particular day. And I think you know, have to spend a week getting yourself in that kind of mindset. But ultimately, that, that's what your know, leadership is. you doing what you say you're going to do and, and, and following it through and, and doing what's right for the team regardless of, of what's going to happen to you. And I, I think certainly that's the way uh, the best Leaders I've worked with in sport uh, are prepared to do that. You, you spoke about beating Australia in Sydney. Um, you spent some time in around the area, at Wollongong, as you was coming into the, your, your career. What was that like? What did you get from that experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was that probably the experience that really um, made me... Give me If I hadn't gone for that experience in Wollongong, I doubt when I'd become a Super League player. Um, because I, I was out there with Greg Mackey. Greg Mackey was my coach. And up until that point, um, I understood, you know, the technical capabilities of, of, of the game. But Greg Mackey um, was a great believer of the mental side of the game. You know, mentally, you have to be right for the game. These are the things you need to do mentally to be ready for the game. Uh, and I really, you know, we didn't always see eye to eye. Uh, we had, you know, quite a forthright and blunt relationship with each other. But I'm incredibly grateful for the relationship I spent with him. Because um, it just opened my eyes to just how important just the mental side of, of, of sport is. And, um, you know, the best analogy is if you think about, if someone's listening, you think about your worst game and your best game, barring injury. Um, physically, I bet you don't feel that much different. You know, you, you're not mouse fitter or less fitter. I think it's just these top two inches that dictate, uh, certainly with the league, you know, what your performance is going to be. And, and, and uh, Greg Mackey was key in hammering that on to me. And it took me a while to understand those messages. And, and eventually take take them on board, and uh, but now as I lot look back, I'm incredibly grateful for for the time he spent with me and the effort he did. And you know, he's a guy who's passed away now, unfortunately. But yeah, he, he, he uh, I owe a lot of my career um, to the work and effort he put in for me. Yeah, that's something we're going to speak about. And obviously, looking at your biggest you know game breaking moment or career defining moment, you say that going to Australia was probably that. Yeah, I would say I would say that um, it was. There was a few, you know, and I, I think that was one of them. I think you often have setbacks or seminal moments in your life and you either uh, disappear from it or, or you bounce back, bounce back and I, I, I'd be greater for it. And certainly going to Australia was one of those. I came back with a real determination to make it into the first team and do whatever it takes, train harder, be mentally tougher. And then I suppose another good setback for me, uh, I've had, you know, I've talked to the two of me. Uh, the one was in 1999 when I didn't get picked for the grand final, um, you know, featured in the team. It was my debut season for the Bulls, played about 18, 19 games. Featured in all the games running up to, to uh, the grand final, played in the win when we beat Saints 44-6. And then uh, I got dropped uh, for the grand final, the day before the grand final, I had to ask coach and um, you know, I probably spent the first couple of days sulking and was pissed off about it but then I suppose by the Monday and come round um, and thought about it I thought you know what what can I do about this what's the one thing I can do about this and I thought I can work myself that hard and throw myself that well into being the best player I can be that the next final weary that if the coach doesn't pick me he's going to look a fool to pick me if he's going to pick someone more experienced over the effort and hard work I'm going to put it then he's going to look stupid and that worked out for me because the next final uh, was in May 2000 and I got picked, uh, played the first 20 minutes in the Challenge Cup final at, at Murrayfield. So that's a, an incident um, that happened a setback, but then I, it put fire in my belly and made me determined to come back and be a, a better version of me and a better player of me. And then I suppose that another one would be in 2003 when I, uh, I, uh, I broke my knuckles and uh, put my hand through a plate glass window, drunk and uh, slit all my hand open and was out of the game for six to eight weeks. And I reckon my career probably plateaued a bit by then. Uh, probably gone away from the things that have made me successful. 
Uh, and during that time, that six to eight weeks off, I realized I had to get back to working really hard, working really hard. That was got me to the top. And I, I owed everybody, you know, I owed my teammates, I owed the fans, I owed the supporters, I owed my family for my stupid mistake. It made me a lot more professional. Uh, worked hard. I came back from that one, the Man of Steel that year. So I think we, we often have setbacks or incidents in our lives. You, I don't, none of us are perfect, are we? Uh, but the question is, what do you do next? You know, what do you do next after you've had kind of one of those uh, problems or inc incidents? And for me, uh, they've generally led me on to doing greater and better things, but only because of the actions I've been prepared to take afterwards. Accountability, absolutely accountability. And, and you said you sulked for a couple of days. Other players might have continued that and, and, and point the finger and probably get you nowhere. Taking that responsibility to improve has obviously had that massive impact as you move forward. You touched briefly on, on leadership and when people say Jimmy Peacock, what runs next to that is is leadership and you know, you've captained every team you've played in pretty much. So you've mentioned a couple of things about what makes you a good leader. What type of leaders do you respect and look up to? Um, again, I think it's uh, I think leaders who, uh, if you think about the coach you've had, you want someone to be, to be open and honest with you um, and give you the right feedback. And sometimes you get feedback you won't like, but I'd rather than be honest and then duck the issue. I think for me, it's about being fair, about doing what you're saying you're going to do. And I think for me, I think if you have a leader who cares about you, then you're prepared to go the extra mile for, for them. If you think about anybody who's ever led you, you know, within a team and you thought they cared that little bit for you, then you'd be prepared to do that extra for, for them. And I suppose in terms of the best I've worked with, the best would be Brian McDermott. Um, I think Brian, for me, uh, certainly in my experience of Brian was, he did care about you. Um, he could draw up a great narrative for the team to follow, which was that higher purpose of trying to uh, just win the trophy itself. It was straightforward. You know, you knew where you stood with him. He wasn't, he didn't shy away from having uncomfortable conversations with you. They would still be uncomfortable for him, but he was prepared to have them with anybody uh, within the team. Uh, and Maka always did what he said he was going to do. He was kind of authentic along the way. And uh, I think, for me, he would stand out uh, as the one. Uh, there's no, there's no wonder that he's, you know, the, the highest, uh, won the most grand finals out of any coach in, in the in the country. Uh, he's got the ability to get the best out of people because of the way he can lead people. And I think fundamentally, it, it kind of boils down. There's lots of things in and around leadership, and you spend quite a bit of time thinking it. You know, as you finish playing and working in the field that I do, and I think it boils down to three things for me. I think leadership's about creating trust. We spoke about trust earlier, and I think people have to trust you. And people trust in you if you're authentic and you, you always do what you say you're going to do and you tell the truth. You know, that creates trust. The second thing is to have good communication skills, um, the way that you speak to people and understand everybody's a little bit different, but also have the good communication skills to be able to build a narrative to bring everybody uh, in together. And then the third thing I think for me is about having deep relationships with people spending time understanding that everybody's different building the relationships up so that you can care about them as individuals and they'll understand and care for you and the team and i think that they're the three things um, that good actions in leadership get they get you trust they get you deep relationships and you've got one good communication uh, and i think if you if you're trying to work in a leadership role if you can kind of rate yourself in those three areas all, all the time each week then i think you generally be on be on the right kind of path for what you're trying to do Beautifully articulated, I agree with all that. I think it's fantastic for us to gain insight into what makes Jamie Peacock tick in terms of leadership there. Thank you. Yeah, so, you answered, one of my questions I was going to ask, you know, you've answered you know, in terms of a coach, but looking back as you as a player, um, is there any, and this is a question I've asked everybody, what's the best drill or coaching activity that, you know, one, either you like to uh, deliver or two that you've been involved with and enjoyed the most? No, <laughs> It's a tough question, this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I think the training drills I used to like most, okay, were like competitive games. Mm. I, I used to really love those games where you, you play against each other and you play for like 10, 15 minutes and it was like a game and you get a certain amount of points for building pressure. And I, and I love them more than anything because they just replicated the game so much. So for me, I think good training drills, training drills that you can enjoy, there's a sense of trying to win but you understand why you're trying to win it and that they put you under pressure fatigue-wise. 
I, I think they've been the, the great ones for me. And I just always think, for me personally, I, I like doing fitness drills. You know, I was a big believer in doing fitness because I always used to think I'd rather be tired now than tired on the pitch later. So I think if anybody's looking uh, to do extra training drills, I think fitness is always a good one because it even because I think the more tired you get, the the, the, the lower your skill levels drop. Okay, so I, I think one of the biggest impacts you can have on your skill levels is being fitter than anybody else because you just don't get as tired. And that means your skill levels don't drop. And yeah, you should practice your skills as well. But don't forget being fit is a, a really important component of your skills not dropping and improving your skills. And what it will do, it will improve your skills in the most important parts of the game, which is generally near the end when the games get decided and everybody else is tired. You, you will won't be fatigued, so you'll think clearer and you'll execute better on, on, on your skills. So don't underestimate the power that fitness drills can have on skill under pressure within a game. As we um, kind of draw this kind of to an end, Jamie, I know you, you, you've got something else on. So I just want to kind of move into the present day. You've, you've taken all your expertise and what you've built as a player and all the stuff I've listened to, and, and now you're successful in business with a, a whole host of different projects that are benefiting from, from your expertise. How was that transition? Can you just talk us through stepping out, being a player into the business world? Yeah, I think the transition is, is difficult for players. You all have the different challenges in your own way. I think the more I think about it, the one thing that really helped me is that I never looked in the mirror uh, and saw myself as Jamie Peacock, the rugby player. I looked in the mirror and saw Jamie Peacock, the person who plays rugby. Um, so I've never defined myself as a rugby player. I define myself as a person who played rugby. Uh, I think if you can understand that as a player, it will really help you when you make a transition from being a sports person into the real world. Things I miss as a player is, you know, playing under pressure, playing in big games and being physically challenged. And, and to do that, to make up for that, I like to do, obviously, long distance running. We spoke about that. I think you can get get you in a place that's pretty dark and pretty difficult and uh, it's a challenge to push yourself through and, and I enjoy that. That kind of makes up that for me. And then I suppose finally, I think kind of the things that I was good at at, at rugby in, in terms of working hard and understanding people are skills that anybody can have. And I think a lot of my um, skills that allow me to be a good rugby player are not... Uh, I'm not limited to the rugby field. Not, it's not about spin passing a ball or tackling a ball. It's obviously, you know, some of the things we spoke about tonight, about being authentic, about delivering on, on what we're saying they're going to do and just holding people accountable and being self-disciplined. And I think, you know, most of my businesses are based around teaching those kind of things to other people. And, and I think the thing about the, the, most of the things that I teach is that it's just kind of choices that you can make along the way, you, you know. I think we, I think our lives are based around our success is based on the decisions we make each day, and I, and I think we do have natural talent in what we do, but whatever skill we have, we can hone it by making better decisions each day. And I think for me, uh, understanding that has allowed me to try to move that in, into the business world. And I think one of the things I understood um, probably to do with rugby is that you make, get to meet a lot of great people, uh, you know, associated with with the club, great businessmen and, and a really wise guy, Paul So you, you know him from all, he told me, uh, Jamie, your, your network in life is kind of your net worth. And I think because I've always cared about people, invested in people, when I've retired, uh, I, I've got great relationships with people, which has allowed my business to develop. And I think that's the key for anybody or any player listening or anybody is that relationships are really important as well. If you, you want to retire, you've got to spend time building in relationships with people because ultimately I think good people will want to help you out when you finish playing Fantastic advice and just drawing to, uh, to an end so like Danny said the last question is now you are sort of in that working world and, and away from sport you know day to day playing what does a typical week look like and then what's your what's the future hole what's your end goal um, Yeah my, my weeks uh, I think a lot of rugby players find it hard not having the routine anymore, whereas I ate the routine at the end of it. I was sick of being told when, where, where to be, at what time, and we had to train at this time and do this at that time. I, I just had enough of it when I finished playing. So for me, my my routine's all, all over the place, I, and I love it that every week I do is a different week. I could be mentoring somebody, I could be delivering health and wellbeing, working for the Rhinos, meeting someone, helping, helping somebody out, you know, I help someone wanting some opinion from me, trying to help out an ex-player. It's just my, my life is really varied. 
uh, in terms of work life. The thing that lockdown has helped me to understand is that I need better work life balance. Um, and I've been trying really trying to work hard on that. Um, it's going to be constantly be a challenge to me because I like to be busy, but uh, that's for me to try and keep doing going forward. And then what does the end goal look like? Well, I, I think you guys know there's no end goal, is it? It's, it's the journey and it's a cliche, but you know what? I, well, I swear, it's fucking true. It is the journey. Do you know, it's the journey along the way. And I, and I think, I don't know where I want to be. I've got an idea roughly where I want to be ultimately, but, you know, I'm just enjoying what, what I do and my life at, at, at the moment. And we've, I think we've just come through an incredible difficult time as for most people. And we've got some difficult times in Edinburgh. And for me, I think, what's it look like, the journey at the moment? It's just trying to find the positives, uh, trying to find a positive each day and trying to surround myself with people who are positive. And I think over the next, you know, 12, 18 months, life will be a lot easier before we do get back to the normal normality, which might be the end of 2021. But at some point, we're going to get there. And I think the key is at the moment is surrounding yourself with, with the right people and just making sure you're a positive influence on yourself. Fantastic. And let's say from, from our point of view, I think it's been incredibly inspiring. Uh, it's great to catch up with you. Uh, and I think there's so much that players, coaches and just you know, the general public can take out of this. So thanks for your time from, from myself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, cheers. sorry. <laughs> Come on. Cheers, Danny Rob. It's been a pleasure. Really great questions. Good questions, Mecca. Good, good podcast. And yours have been great, so thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your time, like Rob said. Inspiring motivating uh, we wish you all the very best with your businesses as you navigate through covid and lockdown and uh, we'll catch up again soon enjoy your your nice meal you're going for tonight um, <laughs> you're looking sharp so we'll, we'll catch up try the best mate i've got to try the best <laughs> um, cheers mate so